people think that it's a very scary job but frankly i feel much safer inside a forest than driving on a highway in india you know as long as you know your animals you know you you know like if a, if a dangerous snake comes in you just need to know that you stay away you know i don't i don't do the um, hero march you're trying to lift it up and all yeah 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 Hi everyone, welcome to Now Boarding, a new travel podcast by me, Payal Nair. This show aims at creating awareness about ecotourism, sustainable tourism, responsible travel and a lot more. We will cover stories and journeys of people who are ecotourism specialists and those who are leaders in their field. We will also be talking to people who have had unique travel experiences, remarkable conceptual places to stay, unexplored cultures and ancient histories of various towns and cities around the world. Join me in this journey of knowing more about travel. Get inspired to see the world and discover your inner self. Hi everyone. Today I'm in conversation with Kalyan Verma. Kalyan is a very talented, accomplished, award-winning wildlife photographer. He's also a filmmaker and as I have seen on his website, he also says that he's an explorer. Um he freelances for BBC Natural History, uh Nat Geo Channel, a lot of international independent production companies. Um, he's also working on environmental issues and wildlife protection, which uh, he's made his priority. So I'm so happy to be uh, in conversation with you today. Thank you so much, Kalyan, for joining me. It's my pleasure, Pai. Really nice to talk to you. Great. So um, I don't know. I mean, you know, when I was researching, I was thinking, okay, where there is so much to talk about, and I didn't know where to start off with. So maybe we can just uh, begin with um, what triggered, you know, your your sort of love and fascination for wildlife photography. Where where did it all begin? I think I've had fascination since childhood for for anything wildlife. Uh, I grew up in a relatively middle class family, so um, you know, I mean, at least growing up, at least till I was late teens, there was, there was, we didn't have a camera in our house and things like that. <clears throat> we did have, you know, one of those tiny pointed shoes, basically for family portraits. Right. Um, but um, <clears throat> it's it. I think once I started working post college is is when my photography and wildlife photography journey took off with my first salary i bought my first camera this was still back in the days when um, you know it was the film days you know this still hadn't come in um and i started doing multiple types of photography but once i started visiting his national parks and and tiger reserves i kind of knew that this is it this is what i wanted to do and at least back then photography was a side hobby i mean on weekends i would go out and take pictures and things but within 2 3 years i kind of realized that this is what i wanted to do for the rest of my life um and uh, yeah after 3 years working in 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 an it company uh, back then i was working at yahoo uh, i quit and i decided to pursue it full time um of course it was looking back it was a bit stupid also because Uh, I was kind of wasn't sure how I was going to make my livelihood out of it, but <laughs> but I knew that I wanted to pursue this, so I kind of had a little bit of savings and kind of dived into it. So, did you have any formal training? Did you need any formal training, or it was just um, you know as you as you went along, you experienced, exposed yourself to different kinds of photography, and that's how you got into it. <clears throat> Yeah, both. Of the, I mean, with wildlife photography, there are two things you need to know. One is, of course, the photography itself, all the technicalities and things. But the second part, which is probably the more hard, most harder part, is understanding animals and wildlife. You know, anticipating behavior. When will they do what? Uh, things like that. So both of them have been a steady journey. I mean, I never gone for any formal classes either in photography or wildlife, but. as you spend more and more time in the field you just will just get better at it i mean i tell a lot of people it's it's a bit like uh, learning to drive a car you know because you you might know all the theoretical things but only if unless you like only when you drive every day for a couple of weeks you you get comfortable and you're driving smoothly you're not stalling at uh, traffic lights and things so in this, in some sense with wildlife photography that journey can take years if if not decades uh, in fact even today 
at least I, I at least I think I know everything about photography. But with wildlife, I'm still learning it. Something new happens every time I'm out in the jungle, and it surprises you. And um, and as a photographer and a filmmaker, that's what I look for because looking for stories that people don't know about, and and, and our natural world has so many stories to tell uh, and offer, which you can learn a lot from as well. Yeah, so I mean, you know, you mentioned uh, yeah. as a photographer, the actual equipment and handling of the equipment, of course, can come, you know, with uh, trial and error, but it's the behavior of the animal, because <clears throat> I would think that uh, different animals, different uh, within different environments would react differently if, you know, if they're hungry or th their reaction would be different or if they are, um, I, I mean, it's, it, it's very uh, unpredictable, right? So how do you then um, learn that animal behavior? What is it that actually gives you that instinct to know when um, and how an animal, you know, whoever, whatever type of animal it may be, how is the animal going to react and at what point in time? Um, I mean, how, how does that learning even happen? That you can only get by spending time in the field, you know, uh, spending enough time in the jungles. I mean, I'll tell you one thing. I mean, one other trait definitely you do need as a wildlife photographer is patience. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, people watch National Geographic documentaries and, and think that, uh, you know, I'll just go for two drives in, in a national park and I'll see tigers and leopards and tigers hunting something, deer, everything, you know. Uh, but that's not true. I mean, for, for typically a one-hour film that I make, it usually takes me about three years, you know. And there are days where um, I've spent, I was doing a film on tigers last year and for two weeks, I didn't even see a tiger. Forget filming tigers. And, and even when you do see the tiger, you want to capture some behavior, right? And, and for all, most often, cat, I don't know if you have cats, but cats love to sleep. You know, so even when you are with the tiger, it's just sleeping all the time. So it's not like you can continuously keep shooting. So you're going to have to wait, anticipate. Uh, and like you rightly said, um, <clears throat> every animal is different. Yeah. Uh, it reacts. It, it, it has, it does different things depending on time of the year as well. You know, uh, for example, if you want to film in the Himalayas, um, going in summer and going in winter is completely two different worlds. It's the same animal in the same setting, but, you know, because they're dealing with extreme temperatures, what they do is completely different, mm. you know. Just last week, I was filming uh, langurs, um, the monkeys in Jodhpur. Um, and they're quite friendly because, you know, people feed them and all that stuff, but, but they're in a jungle. Uh, and it was quite fascinating because by, I was there for, I think, almost three weeks. By end of three weeks, I knew about 15 of them. You know, I could just look at them and say, you know, that one guy will be the guy who will be always mischievous. You know, he'll always try to jump mm -hmm. on the camera and things. There'll be one guy you, uh, who's usually a grumpy guy. You know, he'll, if you go too close to him, he'll like, you know, won't like it too much. Um, and the other thing you also need to know is how much you can push, you know. Yeah. Uh, you, we always want to be as close to the animal as possible to film, but animals don't like it. And different animals have different tolerance levels, you know. And like I said, within the same animal, like within the same group of monkeys, one monkey might let me, you know, like go and groom him and, you know, touch and everything. But his other monkey wouldn't even let me go close. Like if I go, more, if I used to go close more than two, three um, feet close, he would just like bark at me. So... I think some interview while I was researching you, you mentioned that you have a special affinity for elephants. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. And why is that um, the case? So, you know, it's very easy to see a, a primate and associate our human emotions kind of on it. But elephants is not like, it's, it's a big animal, you know, and it's a big, very dangerous to film as well. But one thing I find fascinating about elephants is that how human-like they are, you know. Um, you, you, just by looking at elephants, you can tell when they're grieving, when they're happy. You know, as humans, you know, we, we have facial expressions, you know, when, when we're grieving, we cry, when we're happy, you know, all, all those things. But elephants don't have that. But even without that, you can tell depending on the body language and things. 
you know uh, how they're feeling and you know it's like for like if a mother and a calf for example you know it's 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 how careful a mother would be with a human child you you see the same kind of gentleness playfulness sometimes even scolding you know I've, i i i have to say i've seen elephants scolding the young ones you know uh, so you can't help but connect with them it, it, they're just so uh, beautiful and being so big you know and and you know as a photographer a filmmaker it, it's quite dangerous working with elephants especially on foot because if they want they can just trample you yeah trample they can just trample you, you. <clears throat> yeah yeah i uh, you know the amount kind of you respect them and they end up respecting you back over time uh just to give you an example i was filming this one particular herd in down south in in western ghats and i still remember the first one or two weeks you know the she used to be there with her calf she used to chase me every time i used to run with my camera by end of third or fourth week um you know she started letting me come closer and closer and closer wouldn't chase me as much you know elephants they can't see well mostly they depend on smell um so i used to wear the same deodorant every day so that the elephant would know it's me you know even if i change my clothes and things um and by and and that one grew closer and and by end of third or fourth month i could go closest to the elephant but if any other human being would try to come that close she would go and ch chase them you know mm -hmm. and uh, and i have to tell you this one incident where um once i was filming i was sitting down and filming at the end of a swamp and she was uh, feeding there and some people had showed up there they were making noises she was getting quite disturbed and she did something which i never thought would happen which is she took the calf pushed the calf towards me and ran and chased all those people the so calf, it was like you you protect my my calf and i i couldn't help but to think that she she felt safe enough that she yeah. she would have babysit her calf like her calf would be safe with me yeah she chased all these other humans ran back i was i thought i was going to die because the calf was a meter away from me you know it, you don't with wild animals you don't go do that uh, uh, but but i couldn't get up so she came back just took the calf away and went and the flood of emotions i felt that day I, i i don't think i've ever had you know a better day in my life you know to, for a wild elephant to let me babysit its calf you know wow that's that's fascinating yeah that's that's like wow <laughs> um so what um you know obviously challenges as a wildlife photographer is you know when you're in the deep uh jungle or forest and um it's it's the the reaction to the animals which can be quite challenging but what are the other kind of challenges that as a as a wildlife photographer you faced um and you've tried to overcome um for me the hardest part is trying to find the stories you know okay. um you know a lot of people think that it's a very scary job but frankly i feel much safer inside a forest than driving on a highway in india you know <laughs> uh, i love it you know your animals you know you you know like yeah. if, a, if a dangerous snake comes in you just need to know that you stay away you know i don't i don't do be a hero march or trying to lift it up and all yeah 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 you know you, you give animals space they give you space um for me as 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 a, i mean i see myself as a storyteller you know photos and videos are just the medium right and in a way you know at least 20 30 years ago you could show a new animal to people you know people would have never heard of or seen about a certain type of bird or or a, you know certain type of behavior or even certain type of land, habitat you know people like 30 years ago people didn't know how the bottom of our oceans look like you know and and now we have technology to do that so any animal that's there on earth has been photographed thousands of times and and filmed thousands of times you know so when so we don't have new exotic animals to show but it's the same animals but it's how you tell the story of their lives is what you can keep changing every time sometimes technology helps you tell tell stories in in, in new ways now we have cameras which we can film in absolute pitch darkness without any lights you know because most animals are active in the night hmm. and that's a world that was inaccessible for us because you know to to shoot them you had to switch the lights on or a flash and that would scare away the animal you know so now we have technologies we can do into the night 
we have aerial now we have drones and things you know where we're able to see perspectives of animals which you couldn't do before so for me year after year i have new tools and technology gadgets to tell the story you know it's, it's probably the same story but i'm telling the story with new perspective yeah you know um it, it's like a it's like a shakespeare's um, famous work where there are multiple adaptations of it right yeah it's, it's, it's yeah like <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Same, the behavior is the same but you're kind of showing people in a fresh way essentially. yeah and and that's the challenge each time i go out in the forest is like okay you know i'm sitting with this tiger and okay i'm gonna tell the story of this tiger in a different way you know when you get commissioned are you is it your idea of where you want to go um, and what part of whether it's within India or outside of India, what part um, part of, you know, um, a nature reserve that you'd like to go into or um, whoever commissions you says, OK, you know, this is what we're thinking. And so this is what where we'd like you to go. So this commissioning thing works both ways, you know. Uh, I I actually attend a lot of wildlife scientific conferences. I have a lot of friends who are wildlife scientists. So I'm kind of clued into any new discovery that has happened, or somebody has found some some new cool thing about an animal which which we didn't know before, you know. Okay. And and once I get that intel, I kind of make it into a proposal. And I go to the channel and say, hey guys, you know, there's this cool behavior that nobody's ever seen and maybe we can make a film out of it and then they would, might say yes or no um sometimes it works the other way around you know for example um let's say two years from now is chinese year of tiger you know so the national geographic or disney might come up to me and say hey you know what two years from now you know they're going to be tiger celebration about tigers throughout the world so it'd be nice to have a nice film about tigers you know so it kind of works both ways on how you get the project commission. And in a way, one good thing about today's day and age is that the industry is a bit of a gold rush. You know, uh, I remember as little as 10, 15 years ago, you really had to struggle for projects, you know, um, because it's controlled. See, if you look at uh, wildlife content, at least production side, there's only those three, four channels. There's BBC, National Geographic, then Discovery, really, you know. Um, <clears throat> But what happened now is that in the last few years is because of these OTT platforms like Netflix and Disney Plus and things, everybody wants original content, so which is great. And and technology also has changed, right? So I would have made a film 10 years, 15 years ago, but it was all in HD. But now everybody wants that same like a film on Tiger in 4K. You know, so sometimes technology has changed, so you kind of have to uh, redo some of those films with the new technologies, with the new, new twists and new plots and stories actually. And frankly, the production completely depends on a lot on budgets. You know, some of them we have low, mid-level budgets, and some like this tiger film I was doing, we have like a ten million dollar budget for it. You know, and 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 it's also time. Um, typically, if it's a pure wildlife behavior show, you need minimum two years at the, at the minimum, if not more. Some of the bigger shows can take up to four years, um, because you might plan one season and and it just might be raining at that time of the year and you didn't get that animal. So you might have to come back the year, year after to do it again. So, and, and with wildlife, the animal behavior, nothing's in your hands. You know? Yeah. So yeah. You kind of yeah. Have that space. Yeah. So yeah. Typically for a big budget, I mean, really at a big budget, we'll have a camera crew of, I don't know, eight to 10 people who are spread out across the world. You know, so I, I, because I'm based in India and South Asia, I do a lot of Asia related shoots just because I, I know the animals, you know, you see, it doesn't make sense. See, I've been filming tigers and, and like places like Rantam, but I know I've given them names, like, you know, I know individual <laughs> tigers, like, so it doesn't make sense for a new person to come from somewhere to film those tigers because it, it'll take him weeks and months to figure out this behavior. Where yeah. at, you know, so kind of, <clears throat> yes, I sometimes get shoots to work in other parts of the world, but I like working in South Asia because I know the animals. Because somebody says that, hey, we want to shoot lang langurs. I know exactly the truth you know where they are what they do and things so um so the shooting process goes on and, and as the shooting process goes on this two year to three years the we start building up the script you know as we're getting the shots in uh, and 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 i'll be honest with you you know sometimes you see a like a three minute behavior of an animal 
but from start to finish it might not have been the same animal mm. you know we, it's not yeah the same. it's hard yeah i can i totally understand that yeah so, i mean we're not fooling people but yeah you know, we, we, we try to be clever narrative not to indicate that it's the same but you know we have to do that sometimes we have no choice <clears throat> so we build up those stories over time and frankly once we finish shooting it takes about six months of post-production you know uh, and the post-production pretty much all documentaries in the world happen in uk because that's why you have editors who can go through these hours and hours and hours of footage and pick saying okay okay a shot of this langur running from here and i and a shot of a langur jumping on another langur i've shot probably three months later he could put it together and make it look like this langur ran and mm -hmm. jumped on the other langur you know so yeah. editors, uh, yeah. i mean Frankly, in, in wildlife films, the editors who put the film together at the end of the day, you know. Uh, one of the nice things is that philanthropy is taken up in a big way in India right now. So if the young filmmakers who want to do a five, 10 minute film about a particular environment issue, it's very easy to raise funding for it, you know, and, and, and I'm happy people want to contact me often. I'm, I can help them put them in touch with people who fund these projects. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. In fact, even I'm doing, um, and so you're a guest um, as a part of the series that I'm doing um, on, you know, wildlife photographers and filmmakers and how I think it's so important to send that message across. Um, and, um, and, you know, I'm really happy that I was able to have this conversation with you before you traveled off again. I would say, you know, I, I, I don't think there isn't anybody who loves nature or wildlife, you know, I just, some people are privileged to spend more time in nature and, and, and experience it more. Maybe a lot of people don't have that, you know, but what I would tell people is that, you know, considering where we're headed, natural world is the only one that's going to save us, you know, and if you don't protect our natural world, we are headed for doomsday and, and it's, it's now or never and really, I, I mean, I really think that in the next five years, if we don't take enough actions, we are, you know, going to make, we're going to uh, screw up our planet so badly that we'll be, never be recovered. So thank you once again. It's just been lovely talking to you. And good luck with your forthcoming projects. Thank you, Pal. Really nice talking to you. And uh, <laughs> be in touch for sure. In this series of conversations with nature and wildlife photographers and conservationists, Now Boarding hopes to be a part of an important ongoing dialogue on the challenges and threats being faced by wild animals and the long-term impact on our ecosystem and biodiversity. Join us by sharing your thoughts and also your support with a one-time donation will help us to continue bringing you more and more such meaningful conversations. You can find all the information on how to contribute in the show description.